All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the No Laying Up podcast. First of 48 um, postmortems on the 2023 Ryder Cup, joined by my guy, DJ Pie. Hello, Pie Man. Ciao, ciao, Sully. Back in Milwaukee. Uh, haven't thought about anything else. I've only been thinking about the Ryder Cup for some reason. Uh, I cannot wait to find a couple people who want to talk about it as much as I do. Welcome to my world, Pie Man. <laughs> I enjoy seeing you getting engulfed in this. I've already had four phone calls today strategizing for 2027. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this this guy counts as well. I believe he's, he's going to be a part of 2027. Mr. Max Homa, welcome to the show, pal. Uh, excited to talk some Ryder Cup with you. Oh, man. Thank you guys for having me. I, I too, am excited to to chat about this. It is consuming my mind. Uh, it, is, it is a crazy week. DJ and I usually have basically a semi-weekly. We're solving all of the world's problems. So it'll be nice to do this publicly uh, today for the first time. We're we're killing it, by the way. As you can tell, things are going great <laughs> in golf. So everything's good. Everything's going really good at that department. <laughs> Uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Titleist and the new T-Series irons. Max, I believe I saw you put a T-153 iron in the bag for the Ryder Cup. I know you've had some success adding T-Series models for your four and five irons. I myself am a T-150 guy all the way through the bag. Uh, you know, Have you gone to those models at the long... You know, Sorry. Why have you gone to those models at the long end of your set? Yeah, so I have a... I, I've been blending from six. I have still have a blade, but then I start to blend five, four... I typically play a seven wood, but I always have a three iron um, that I travel with just in case. And at Olympia Fields, it started to feel funny, just more the the shaft. And so I I knew at Marco Simone, we were going to need to hit the ball straight. So had JJ make me a bunch of different ones with uh, different shafts and found this one I loved. And it was really useful out there, especially in the afternoons when the ball got running, you could really use it off the tee. So they're just easier to hit. I feel like they're very versatile, and, and I hadn't really hit many three irons off the ground. Um, you know, it's usually just been off the tee, but one of my favorite shots of the week was a three iron off the off the fairway on a on a par five that flew just like, you know, four or five iron do, and it was it was really fun to have that versatility. So, you know, that, that whole T100, T150 series has been a, a big uh, advantage I feel like I've had in my bag. Yeah, I remember those guys were talking about you were uh, one of the one of the le- the late ones in transitioning to a mixed combo set. Uh, of <laughs> and you've enjoyed some success since doing so. So, what are uh, we're recording this Tuesday afternoon, fresh off the Ryder Cup, a little jet lag mixed in. I came home with probably whatever was running through the U.S. team room. It sounds like or it feels like it's just, this a, is hum- my- just a humble oh. brag. I knew those people were going to be out there. Oh, the U.S. team sick? Yeah, no, I've been feeling I sick think- too. <laughs> I, pro- I probably caught something from them. I think because we were just we were talking so much. So, you know, I just I probably picked it up. <laughs> uh, what, are, what are your emotions like coming off, a, if I may say, a successful personal first Ryder Cup, but a loss as a team? I'm sure it's a lot, but uh, where, where does your mind go when I ask that? Oh, I mean, it. I do not mean this in, uh, in Jess. It is a true bummer. I, I'm very proud of myself, but I'm not, like, happy with the week. It, I had so many happy moments and fun moments and, we had galvanizing moments and all these great things. But at the end of the day, we, we had 20 minutes of hope there that Sunday and it was about as fun as it got. And then when, you know, we were getting news, like kind of getting thrown at us. They, that course, by the way, amazing job with the screens because we could yeah. watch the golf the whole time and it was very easy to tell what was going on. But as you're kind of running back, we ran back to go see – Justin plays 17, 18, and then as we're basically coming on 18, Colin, or I think was the one who told me that um, I think Rick had hit it in the water and and we had lost. So it, it just, it, it was, it was hard. You know, it's fun, obviously for myself, I, I, I had a great week personally as far as on the golf course, but it's difficult because I, I'm not there to – I'm there to make as many – score as many points as I can as everyone is, but I'm there to celebrate with my team on Sunday when we win. And it was a, it was weird for me because it just was a uh, – if you had told me at the beginning of the week you are going to go three, one, and one, I would have not believed you that I would have played five. I wouldn't have – I, I would have believed I could have gone three, one, and one, but I would have been over the moon. And then if you would have told me we would have lost and all that, then I would have just traded it for something else. So – it, it was a um, it was a bummer of a week. A lot of really amazing moments that I'm going to take with me forever. You know, I told the guy Saturday night 
when we were leaving the course, I said, all you guys who have played on these before, uh, and, and some of them played many, I said, please just do me one favor. Do not take this for granted. I know we're getting absolutely fucking rocked, but this has been the most fun I've ever had. So please just never take it for granted because even as we were getting killed, it was, it was amazing. It was just an amazing, amazing week. I just wish we would have, I wish we would have finished that comeback. Cause like I said, for 20 minutes, I was like, holy shit, we're going to do it. <laughs> it really, I told everybody that block of red I saw, I was doing the math when I was on 10. And I and Joe Joe and I were talking about it. He's like, "Holy cow, man! Like this can happen. Like this can happen." And then I don't know. It's like that. That hope is the worst thing you can have. And we got it. Hope that kills uh, you for just a bit. Yeah, the hope kills you. But it was it was so much fun. But fun, fun, and feeling uh, like the week went right are obviously very different. I could still have fun and, and be incredibly bummed out. And that's just kind of how I felt uh, the last day and a half or so. All right, so I feel like we could do this, you know, a couple different ways. We can start at the beginning of the week or start at the end of the week and work our way backwards, but the the shot that's most kind of visceral in my head, I think was the 6-7 footer that you made on 18. Uh for anybody who didn't see it, the the situation was you went to 18 with uh Matt Fitzpatrick one up or you were one up on Matt Fitzpatrick, I should say. And par 5, your second shot kind of into the eyelash of that bunker, the greenside bunker. Uh Talk to me kind of about getting up there, seeing that lie and, and everything that happened after that. Well, it's actually funny you start at the end because I was convinced the first tee would be the most nervous I've ever, ever, ever been. <laughs> and I was so wrong. <laughs> uh, I had on the, the first tee to that moment, I, I, I thought I got better as the week went on about like controlling my nerves and just like, it was laughable how nervous I was on the first tee. I felt so calm until right when I stepped into the tee shot, my left leg went nuts. And I, I told Joe, it's like when you're doing a wall sit and you do it a little too long. And I was like, dude, and he's like, Oh, I couldn't see it. And he always jokes. He goes, it's so funny what you feel. Cause he goes, you look so like poised and calm. And I'm like, dude, I just like, lost control of my body, but I hit the fairway. So I was like, I'm going to take that with me. Um, and so I, I fast forward that to the <laughs> last, I would say the last three holes, but that last, that last hole is such a blur to me. When we got home, I nerded out and I told Lisa, I said, I have to watch the last hole like in real time. Cause I was like, I don't remember a lot of it. Like I remember what I felt like. I don't remember it. Just a lot of it was so blurry. I, I, I remember little, Little things, Matt made me putt a 12-inch putt on, I was probably longer than that, but 18-inch putt on 17, and I was nervous, but I was never missing it. I remember walking off the green, security, I'm giving you a very long answer for this one putt. But, you got nothing, uh, I got nothing to taking do. taking you where my brain goes. I got nothing less from you, bags. But uh, the security had done a very poor job all week, I thought, or the volunteers or whatever, um, with when we would walk off the greens, once the Euros, if the Euros were first, like, everyone would follow after them and it got pretty old. It happened the first day on one hole where we were getting killed after nine holes to Victor and Ludwig. And I, I feel bad. I shoved a man out of my way. Like it was just like absurd how many media people were there that were clearly just fans of the, like they weren't media people you could tell. So we were all kind of fed up or maybe I'm not going to speak for everybody. I was fed up with it. And when we were walking off, 17 i was i was pretty pissed off that i was still on the golf course because i thought i should have won by then and and i was and i was pissed that i had to putt a very short putt after giving matt a longer one and then while we were walking off matt had be obviously was already off the green and was up the hill to 18 and all of a sudden it's just getting filled with people and four of those people were the euro team players one of them was rory and I'm like walking behind him and he like had stopped. Was he the guy and you shoved I out of the way? No, <laughs> it was close. <laughs> I will tell Rory if he didn't say sorry, I, I think I was going for him. So he, I Did said, he start waving me. his hat in your face? Is that what happened there? <laughs> uh, I think he had his hat off by then. His, his protest began right as the event ended. <laughs> um, so, but I, I said, excuse me. And I was like very annoyed that they were all there, but he, he obviously it's Rory. He said, sorry. And like moved out of the way, but I was just like, so tilted by that, which was kind of helpful because it like moved my nerves to kind of like back to that kind of 
F you attitude. And then the last hole just a blur and, and, and I was so nervous and tired and all of those things that I got, I thought of one thing that was stuck out the, when I had that putt is that on uh, Friday afternoon, I missed, uh, I had a very, very good putt with Justin uh, against Justin Rose when I played with Wyndham and I, Wyndham deserved to win that match. He played tremendous. The, the back nine, he hold putt after putt and was just rock solid. And I had, you know, 12 feet or whatever on that, that hole. I had a putt missed it and Rosie makes it right in the middle. And I mean, he played unbelievable, deserved it, but I felt awful. And in college, I missed a putt. Uh, I three putt my last hole of my collegiate career to lose to Thomas Peters to lose in match play of the team event. And I was so like despondent for like 40 hours. And I remember flying to the US Open qualifier. And I remember being on the plane saying, I don't know if it will be tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, or 10 years from now. I want that putt again. Like, please let me have that putt again. I do not want to end my golfing career without getting an opportunity to show that I can do that. Like, I know I can do that. And just so happened that the next day I had seven feet to get into a playoff or to keep a playoff going um, to get into the U.S. Open, and I made it. And I remember being over that putt saying, Bubba, you asked for this. Like, you could be nervous, but you asked for this exactly. So you better at least relish that opportunity. And I remember I, Matt missed, and I had seven, seven feet. And I remember saying, you asked, you wanted this. So, like, flip the nerves. You're scared. You're nervous, but you're not scared. Like you asked for this exact moment and you're getting it in the biggest way. But it was just crazy. I was basically telling everybody, you dream your whole life as every single golfer ever has of making a putt to win the Ryder Cup or making a putt to win the Masters or the US Open or whatever. I have never dreamt of making a putt to not lose the Ryder (laughs) Cup. That was a very different feeling. And I had such a good week personally on the golf course that I knew I would be labeled a choker and and it just didn't feel like a fair thing. But I remember I really turned my brain on. You you wanted this. This is a very cool opportunity. But I lost full control of my body. I can't believe watching it that you can't see my legs shaking. I couldn't feel anything. Like my legs were vi- like full blown vibrating. Like my I had fifty phones tied to my legs and everyone was calling me. It was a wild. And I I I, I watched it. Like I said last night, I just don't know how I made it. And that motherfucker was right in the goddamn middle. <laughs> like it was the best putt ever. And I just don't know. It was crazy. And then there, it was funny because I turned to Scotty and Colin. And I, was, I screamed so loud. So loud. And Scotty kind of got amped up. And Colin was kind of clapping. And they didn't know I took an unplayable. They, th- they thought I got a regular drop. So they thought I had two putts. So Scotty said when I hit it, he said, slow down like slow down and i i came up to them after and and i was like going crazy and they were like oh you know scotty kind of scotty said he he decided whatever i did he was going to match my energy so he was up but everybody didn't seem quite as like up as i was well nobody knew and Stand, you, standing next to the green nobody it was just you joe no and the not one there's, person it's not, knew. there's an announcer out there so everybody yeah. just assumed the ball was embedded it made or, sense or after yeah, yeah. no nobody <laughs> quite knew like the rider cups literally on the drop. line for that yeah exactly yeah so i didn't know why they were booing i didn't understand anything that was going on and then we got it back to 17 and scotty goes i had no idea that ball was like for far <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, so it was the craziest moment, but I'm so thankful that I got to have it. Um, and, and obviously I'm extremely grateful that it went in, but yeah, it was that, I don't know. It was, it was, I had so many experiences that week and then to get to kind of finish my, my personal like performance on the golf course with that was really cool. And I don't know, it was, um, uh, I wouldn't call it a dream come true because, you know, none of the actual, the end of it didn't, you know, it wasn't like some, some dream story, but I I was convinced this week that I would take some things from here and, and, and go forward, use it to go forward in my career. And Brooks said something really interesting in the press conference that everybody saw when they asked who wants the ball, like who truly wants it, who wants the putt. And he said very few. And I thought about it all week. Cause I was like, man, you know, to, to him and to everybody in golf, like the, the people who want the ball are major champions. And I have been absolutely tremendously bad in them for what I think I'm capable of. And I was like, I bet you he like, I, I'm not on his short list of people who want the ball. 
Um, and if I had to ask myself deep down in the, I think it's like in your core, like you have to go through, you have to dig. I think everybody would say, I want that putt. And I was like, man, maybe if I dug deep down, maybe I don't want that. And it felt, I thought about it all week. So I was like, I want to be that guy. I want to be, I want, I, I respect so much of what Brooks does in those majors and obviously Tiger and like my favorite athlete ever, Kobe, like they clearly like that's in their DNA. They want that win or lose. And there, you know, you could be in the worst spot ever. And all of a sudden I had a moment where it was, like I said, it wasn't to win it. It was to not lose it, which I think is way scarier. And I was just convinced that like, I'm going to at some point prove that like I, that is who I am. And um, I think even if I missed it, the way I approached it, I was proud of, but it was, I was very happy that it went in. Cause I, I, I want to be one of those people he's talking about and um, I have not proven that yet. So it was, not, it was nice to at least add that to my, at least my Rolodex in my head of things I can harken back on, you know, in hopefully a year's time at, at one of the four big ones. It, this, I'm laughing because my image for that putt. So I'm walking around and I, at this point, it's like, all right, if we keep all the U S flags red right now, the last two matches, you got, all you gotta do is flip those from one down. And all of a sudden this is, this is leaning towards the U S so I'm on 13 green and the reception was really bad. So I'm like uh, on the earpiece and they cut the scoreboard off because there was a match coming through there. So I'm like angling my head in all these different ways to get good reception. And I'm standing up blocking people's views and everyone's like, get down, get down. I'm like, no, Max is putting and this is the right. <laughs> and it went in and uh, yeah, nobody, nobody at the green had any idea that the Ryder Cup was in the balance at that moment. But um, we'll talk what, to you before, before we move on from that real quick, just talking about the, the unplayable because like, I mean, that's got to be one of the most like crushing feelings ever to get up there and realize you, you know, like you said, that that match, it, it felt like it should have been over a few holes ago and, you know, not to dredge anything up, but the the one against Justin, you know, the on Friday kind of was a similar kind of slow bleed, right? That that kind of slipped away from yeah. you guys. And so to get up there and see that, I mean, was was that what was going through your head or what? Talk to me about the conversation with Joe. I talked to him a little bit afterwards. It sounded like you guys had a similar situation on three that you were kind of pulling from. Yeah, so he he brought up the point on three. We, we blocked it or I blocked it way, way right on three. And of course, like it's it felt like this a bit of the theme of the week, but the U.S. team seemed to be on the wrong side of the foot that mattered. You know, like my ball is right. one foot into the into the stuff. And if it was just a foot left, whatever. And I'm Same, man. That's what I was trying to say in our video too. I hit it 40 yards right. Yeah. You know, you're dead. <laughs> and I wanted to hack it out. And he goes, he goes, we have a good lie if you, you know, if you can drop it in this like little down grain on three. And and I and he goes, let's take it unplayable and just get a putt at it. And one of our goals for the week uh, between myself and Joe is to be in every hole as much as we could. Something I'm trying to teach myself is that if if I I'm as complete of a player as I as I believe that I am, and, and I am as good of a putter as I've been this year, then I need to keep giving myself at least a putt to force the other player's hand. So we did a good job there, and, and he talked me into it. And then we got to 18, and it was weird. I didn't, I didn't feel like much about taking them playable. It seemed like the only plausible option. I, I really was not sure I was going to be able to move move that golf ball. There was zero chance I could go anywhere at the green because I'd have to stand in the bunker. And at that point, there was no chance. That grass was probably right where I was, was probably like a foot long. I was, I, I was very, I mean, I, I know I gave him kudos. I need to give him kudos again. I, my head was, I was really frustrated because I had a good drive and I hit a very good second shot as far as like how flush it was. I, I, I we, we always like label shots. Like he will say like, how'd you hit it? Like, you know, one to 10 and for distance. And I told him, I said, I hit that 10 out of 10. I pushed it a little bit, but I was trying to start it maybe eight yards left of that, if not less, and then draw it and just take the water out, but like kind of get it hooking towards the hole. And the only part of it that I didn't do is it didn't draw. But when I hit it, I was like, okay, that's great. I hit it far enough. It's going to be right in the bunker, which is like ideal. And I start seeing somebody looking for my golf ball. I'm like, come on, like this cannot happen again. It happened to me on five the first day, like one foot left of a bunker. And I'm like, what is like, what is my biggest design flaw of these damn golf courses these days is like the massive rough right around the edge of a bunker because it just, it, it was a fine shot and it's no worse than it would have been much worse. If I'm 25 yards right of that, I have a better chance than where I was. So 
and, and then Matt hit this like skeezy, like Healy shot and he's where you would want to be. And I just, I don't know. My head was just spinning. I was frustrated. I said, this is not, this isn't fair. I know golf's not fair. Life's not fair, but I was like, this is BS dude. Like this is, this is not how this is supposed to be. And Joe calmed me down and was like, we're going to take an unplayable. We're going to chip it to 10 feet. You can use the whole right side of the green. You have 10 feet and you're going to make it. I was okay. And then once like I kind of got calmed down, I was like, that is the only option we have because the other one is just to aim kind of just right of where Matt was and swing as hard as I can and hope it goes in the fairway, which seemed ridiculous. It could go zero feet. I mean, it could go anywhere. So (laughs) the only part of it that got bad was you get a circle now to drop in when you take it and play well, you don't have to be dead uh, in line with the pin anymore. Uh, Shout out Tiger at Augusta. (laughs) You can like be you have a little more wiggle room. So the, the rule system told me that. So then I was able to kind of look for where I wanted to drop and get the lie. And I dropped it and the ball kicked dead forward and got stuck in like the one place where it was into the grain. <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh boy. But then I put my club down. There was like a little bit of air under it. So I was like, I think I can slide my club here. I mean, I was, I was also like, you're super nervous and like, this is going to be hard, but Joe wanted me to aim right. And like every golfer does, Joe's like, just right of the right side of the green, use the hill, bring it down. And um, he's saying it. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I'm hitting this at the pin. I'm not, I didn't tell him. I'm like, <laughs> I'm hitting this right at the hole. And like, it's, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to aim a little right, but I'm hitting it. I'm just going to chip it at the hole. But I didn't, like, obviously he was right. But I was just at that point, I was like, I'm hitting the golf shot. And that was one of the cool ones that like, right when I hit it came off, like, the video's uh, funny because I, I remember it differently but the moment it felt like it hit the club face I started walking because I knew it was very very good and then I, I then I thought I made it for a second I was like well, this is the craziest way to end a, end a match of all time and it rolled by the hole and we had uh, actually been practicing the putt Matt had a bunch on the practice round days because we found that his putt was really straight even though it looked like it broke a lot so I almost in my in my soul knew he was going to miss it right. I'd seen, I'd hit that putt. Joe's like, hit this putt. And basically it was like, you won't believe how little it turns. So he misses it right when it came off his blade. I'm like, all right, but you know, it's right. And we're going to have a putt at this. And it was just basically the rest of it was just convincing myself that like, this is what I want to do and I'm going to do it. And uh, so it was just, it was eerie, but all of it makes sense now. But like, I'm getting booed for dropping, which I thought they should be cheering. I'm now chipping for birdie, you know, like, It was very, the whole thing was very odd and eerie, but it was, yeah, it was one of those things where uh, it all went so fast and so, it was so blurry that uh, I I truly can't believe that I even had that opportunity and then that it went the way that it did. Booing, booing on the, on the 18th green of the Ryder Cup. You just don't do that. Yeah, you You don't do that. You just don't do that, but... What, uh, how did the, how did the pairing going back to pairings team wise? How did the pairing with you and uh, Brian Harmon come about for foursomes? Was that something that was, uh, when did you guys know that was going to be the case? And, uh, you know, well, I guess take us, take us there. Is that something that came from the stats guys? Is that something you guys requested? How does that all come about? Uh, I think it comes from, it came from, what well, it came from the stats guys. I guess our foursomes team, uh, modeled really, really well. I think we were like one of the best two teams as far as the, how the games worked out. I was very happy to play with Harmon. We have really hit it off in the last like six to 10 months. We have zero things in common in our lives. <laughs> he, to the point where we play the exact same sport and he does it completely opposite as how I do it. He is a lefty and I am a righty. We are as opposite of people as you can ever imagine, except for that way we think about golf and the way that we approach golf. Um, we are so similar on the golf course. We are intense and we vibe very, very, very nicely. So I was really happy when they said we were going to get to play. I think it was Monday we got called in and uh, how I had heard it is we were almost assuredly going to play twice together. And yeah, we, uh, it, it was fun. It was a bummer. He he woke up that Friday and I, I did not know this, but he was under the weather. He had that congestion thing that I think like four or five of the guys got. And I know people say congestion, but obviously it's a little, it was more than that. Everyone woke up like in mega fogs and just did not feel well. Um, but the best way we could have labored it was some kind of like hay fever type thing. And I didn't know that. And he, he didn't, he didn't tell me. And, and we went out and we played two guys who were, just playing awesome and on fire in our first hole of the Ryder Cup. Victor Hovland chips in from absolutely nowhere, and it just 
it, it, it just went bad from there. I thought we played fine. It's just everything. They hit the pin like three of the first four holes. Um, it was just like one of those one of those rounds. And I was pretty bummed because I was really excited to play with them. And I thought that we were going to kind of show out and two rookies. And I, I really believed in our team. And it was a shame. So, uh, But I'll say, man, playing with Harm was so fun. And, and fri- Friday afternoon, we get the nod to uh, – Zach came up to me Friday afternoon and said, are you going to be okay to play five? Which we heard nobody was going to do on our team. And obviously we knew that there would be ebbs and flows of this. And as we were losing uh, so badly, I figured they're going to have to just start changing things as fast as they can and take whoever feels good or feels energized or whatever it may be. Cause like I said, I wasn't sick. So these guys were just shuffling people in and out. And I said, yeah, I'm absolutely ready to play five. And they said, okay, you're going to go to harm again in the morning. I said, okay. And, uh, I texted harm. I was like, Hey, um, you know, I know it didn't go basically the way we wanted to this morning, but like, be ready. I I would never, I don't want to play with anybody else in this foursome thing. Like I'm ready to rock here. And he, he matched my energy. And I just think that's why we made a really good team. He, uh, he was up with me and, and basically like, I, I, tr- he was, he, I think he said something like, I truly cannot wait to do this again. Like, you know, I cannot wait for tomorrow morning. And we came out and, from the moment we teed off, he was in a different mode and he was in that Brian Harmon, you know, Sunday at the open mind set. And he, he did some of the coolest shit. I get a lot of the uh, credit for that 16th hole, the chip in when we, uh, uh, that morning, Saturday morning when we beat uh, Sepp and Shane, but off the tee, I don't know if it, I don't know if anybody caught it on TV, but off the tee, he, uh, I think he he made a sick par. Yeah, he we made a sweet par on 15. He made a great 12 footer, and then on 16 he tees off first and it's this three wood and it never left the flag. Like it took off and it never left the flag and it's about a hundred yards from him and he looks at me and goes, he goes, I didn't happen to see that. Did you see that? Where's that going? <laughs> I'm like, I think in the hole, Brian. <laughs> like, I think it's going right in the hole. He so he got that cocky swag going and and I mean he hit it so good he went hit three wood over the green. So that he just we had so many cool moments and uh, right after we won that match, Stu, <laughs> Stu, I think Stuart Sink came up to him or something and said, "Hey, um, you guys are gonna play again in the afternoon." And Brian looked at him like basically dumbfounded, saying, "Yeah, I know we are. <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> We're doing this again." So it was it was just fun. I felt like uh, I felt like we really hit it off and. I got lucky. I got to play with him and Wyndham and Wyndham and I had the same thing in the afternoon on Friday. That's why I felt so bad that we lost that one. Cause I felt like we were, we had the same kind of gel going and it was cool. But something about me and Brian that Saturday was just, uh, it, it was very special. It felt like a very special pairing. And like I said, a lot of the foursomes for me is, is in my opinion is how you vibe with people. Obviously the, the stats have to work out that you should fit as a team, but um, a lot of it, I really do believe it's just like, he gave me the freedom. He, he told me, Saturday after that round, he goes, I want you to go be yourself. He goes, if you want to tee off first, tee off first. If you want to tee off second, tee off second. He goes, I just want you to go play. And I was like, all right, cool. And I just felt like that dynamic worked really well for me. I never felt like either of us would ever blame each other or anything. Same with Dub. Like, we just kind of were get to go play golf, and no one's feelings were going to get hurt. We are just going to kind of do what we were supposed to do, and we were fortunate to uh, get a couple of points that Saturday. Did you Did you watch the replay of your chip in on 16? I, mean, I, I would have to be blind to have not seen that at this point. It is I'm exhausted of seeing it. <laughs> somebody, somebody compared it to the edit of the uh, of the famous Tiger, uh, the fake video from yeah. Tiger, the answer handshake. That was uh, that was pretty. It's pretty close to that. I play. I planned it. I mean, I I knew the only thing. Uh, I think I told Seth this too Sunday night. Is the only thing I wish would have happened is Seth hit a beautiful eagle putt, and I wished his shot would have gone in because I wanted to make it on top of him <laughs> so badly. But the moment I told Joe right before I chipped, I said say good night, and uh, I chipped it. And the moment the ball hit the green, I and I I looked at Harm and I said say good night, Harm. And then I I didn't even know the ball went in because they don't really cheer that loud. I didn't even know the ball went in until. I turned around. I for, I almost forgot to get the ball out of the hole. Uh, and yeah, it was just one of those funny things. I had it all, you know, sometimes you plan and script these things in your head. And that, that thing right when it hit the ground, I'm like, well, we won. On to the next one. <laughs> I, <laughs> it, was a, it was a very nice feeling. You get real cocky out there. And it was fun to get cocky for a little bit. 
I, I was trying to wrap my head around this when we were, you know, each night when we got back to do the podcast. But when you're thinking back on all these shots, there's not that many balls in play, right? There's only, you know, in foursomes, there's there's eight balls in play. In four balls, there's, you know, 16 balls in play. Even in singles, there's not that many balls in play. And statistically, you're just seeing so many fucking <laughs> golf shots that should not go in. And I'm thinking about your, your chip in on 16, the, the bunker shot you hold on 15 uh in four balls when you guys were were hitting it all all over the map and oh it wasn't the bunker it looked like the bunker from where i was but uh that one you hold the ones that the one rom hold on 18 in the in the (laughs) four ball match friday afternoon the one victor hold against you guys like there's just all these putts and shots it makes no sense is there anything that can help make help make sense of it in your mind was it the golf course predisposed to that was it guys just hyper focused (laughs) like what the fuck it it almost felt to me like like the shot that you hit at uh wherever that was uh fortnet fortnet when you just had to have it yeah it just feels like you constantly are just hitting these have to have it shots i i that's Clearly, it's a match play thing. the 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 answer is it's the hyper focus of it. I, I also believe that's why Tiger's just chipped in so many times as he's able to get himself in that state. But I mean, I was joking with somebody when we were walking around watching golf Sunday after the uh, after my match was done. I was like, I've chipped in I don't know eight times this season, and I chipped in twice this week and like right. made insane putt after. Like it just all of it happens, but you're so. It's match play. You're able to get into more. I'm going to make this, and then whatever happens after that goes away, a lot more often. But yeah, I don't know. It's so weird. I think about that all the time. I, every year, I watch the Ryder Cup or the President's Cup. I'm like, well, how is everyone making chips? You know, I, how how do you hole out this often? And I, I struggle to hole out ever. And it's just weird how many shots you see go into the hole. I think Rom chipped in like four times the first day. Yeah, uh, made you know crazy putt after crazy putt. It just was like it's very odd. You, I just saw this morning they had the top 10 shots from the week and like the 10th one is like the sickest shot ever. You know, like there's nine more of these. Uh, so it is odd, but I just, I do think part of it's the hyper focus of it. I, this rough is brutal to chip out of it. And the, the pins were tricky and you just see ball go in on so many different occasions. That it makes no sense. Victor's chipping on the very first hole of the whole Ryder Cup was bananas. And it just went right in dead center. And you're just like, Okay, I guess this is what we're doing today. You know, it's very odd. We're we're having we're having way way too much fun here. What what was the vibe uh, Friday night after after zero uh, and four uh, and foursomes and then you know kind of letting a couple slip away in the afternoon? Yeah, um, that I think that was the other bummer of my match is I did feel like if we won that we would have gone to sleep like. I'm not going to say happy, obviously. obviously. It's not like we, we would have cut the lead to something where you're like, oh, this is so manageable. But it, it felt like for the better part of 30 hours, everything went wrong. I truly don't believe we played that horrible. It really felt like everything was going right for them. They played tremendous. I mean, they're obviously everyone at this event, all 24 people are amazing golfers, but it just felt like, if you needed a putt to miss, they made it. And and it we were all joking Saturday to kind of explain why how, how Friday felt. Saturday, I think Colin might have been the one to say it. Colin or Justin, somebody in their group missed like a 15-footer on like the fifth hole. And they, they, I don't know if it was who they were playing, but somebody missed a putt and they're like, that's allowed? Because <laughs> it really <laughs> felt like when we when we were watching somebody else putt a 15-footer, it was like, oh, my God, dead center. And that's what Friday afternoon felt like. It was like Justin played so freaking good. Like I, I think he counted on fifteen of the holes. He was he hit it incredible, and he made uh, all week. But he made everything that Friday afternoon. And we get up to that eighteenth hole, and I just felt like when he made that putt, it just flipped this thing where we went to bed bummed. I spent a lot of time that night in uh, the training room with uh, Scotty, and it was interesting because. I'm going to harp on this. I know people don't give a shit or maybe don't believe me if your name's Tron, but the, the, our team was super, everybody, it was the vibes every night were very good, as far as good as they could be. I think it would have been a lot harder if you're by yourself because you're just like eating away, but we were all really good with each other and like everyone was really together on like, man, you know, like this went this way and this went this way. Nobody was playing any blame game or pointing fingers at anything really, but 
everyone's just kind of on that feeling that like, God, like we all get to the 18th hole and it's just like, we can't seem to make the birdie putt and they chip in or they make a 15 footer or they whatever. And it, it, so me missing that putt on Friday just felt like, man, we could have gone into the night with something. And that's why Saturday night was so fun. Cause when we were walking down, I was walking down 18 with Colin or Justin, Colin and Justin. And I said, honestly, I said, I know we're getting killed, but I just want to go into the night one time happy. Like one time where we're like, yes, because we just felt like we kept getting flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped. And you, you have to flip back at some point in these team events to, create buzz and i mean at the president's cup last year that's kind of what happened we were kicking the shit out of the internationals and then tom kim and cam davis flipped the last two matches and we went in so bummed out and we all had to like turn around and be like, we're winning this thing like we're up a lot but it felt like like the mood changes so quick so everyone was frustrated and bummed but i did feel like everybody was ready to go i mean we kept saying hey there's 20 more points out so uh, somebody wrote it on our board like you know, 20 of 28 points are available. We need 13. Like that's very reasonable. So everyone was very clear headed on that. Um, but I, I will say like, looking back, the difference between how much more optimistic it felt even after Saturday, even though, you know, we had one day left and needed a miracle versus Friday, it was significant just because of how everyone's match seemed to end. What, you know, as someone that's followed, uh, you, I know you've followed the team uh, for a long time, even before you're a part of it, but there just always seems to be, despite any, you know, excitement level going into it, there's that oh shit moment when the U.S. team plays in Europe of like, ah, I forget this happens every time. I had convinced myself it would be different. Uh, I would, it, <laughs> off the jump, it was Hovland chipping in on the very first green. It was like, oh shit, here we go again, somehow for the seventh time in the row, in a row. Did you sense any of that i go what, what what's the explanation you guys tied day two you tied day three you got your asses handed to you on day one how do you explain it like what if, you, if you're doing like a debrief of everything that went down what went wrong on day one and how does how would you have possibly pre prevented the u.s team not getting off the bus the way uh that you guys did I, i'm not really sure um like a, a perfect answer one one thing that I mean, I can only really speak for my matches, but I mean, going out there, I, I mean, me and Harm's first time ever, we were nerve. I, I don't know how he felt. I was nervous and it just felt like we, every single match was, there was blue on the board immediately. Like we lost the first hole so many times to birdies, uh, to, to pars, we, but we, so many times they just seem to birdie the first hole and you're just, you just are stuck in mud and you know, I, like I said, I, I'm shaking my leaf. I imagine Brian's feeling pretty similar. And I stripe a drive down one, and he flags a six iron. And Victor striped his drive down one, and Ludwig skanked this little like it was a sh like kind of like a shady little like eight iron or something, seven iron. And it was nice to see because I'm like, oh, he's nervous too. Like we're all nervous here. And then Victor holds this impo impossible shot where I think I might I might have two putts to win. And um, now it's just like I'm begging on a thirty footer. And it, it just felt like every morning we would get there and I would see up second or third and we'd be down in one or two matches already. And I just think seeing that blue early, I don't know. There's no way to explain it. I don't think anybody was coming in flat. Like not like anybody wasn't whatever, but there was just something about that first and second hole that just seemed like we lost them a lot. And it, it was, it was just, I'm not gonna say we're sitting there demoralized, but when you're behind already, or if you're myself and, and I think Brian in the in the in the in our first match is just like <clears throat> immediately we get a mega roar on the first hole. Everyone's itching to go crazy, the crowd, and here's here's an excuse to ten minutes into to us starting. And then they were up immediately in three in a row or something like that. And it felt like we were climbing out of that immediately, which is a ridiculous thing. You know, Jordan and Justin gave us a lot of great advice that like, hey, we were two down through two to Poulter and Rory in Paris and we won five and four he's like don't get ahead of yourself like these things are not over early but I guess looking back I if I had to answer it I, it just wasn't really getting off the bus it's just that like everybody nobody was birding the first hole much and in our afternoon match I got out there and in, in, in the four ball with Dub and I birdied one but Bob birdied one too and it just kept feeling like where is like we have no red and and I remember walking off the tee um, 
Saturday afternoon off one tee, me and Brian went second, I think. It was either morning or the afternoon, but we went second and we walked up the tee and Zach came up to us and goes, there's red on the board, Sam and Colin birdied one. And it was weird how you're like, oh, yes, like <laughs> hell yeah. You know, it was just like, we just didn't seem, they just owned that first hole and it was not an easy hole. So it just was, I don't know if it was anything more than that. I, I don't think that we have a, I mean, we have a some kind of foursome thing, but I don't, it, none of it makes sense to me. Like we, we tried it all and I, I don't, there, maybe there's deeper analytics to this that I, that I just don't know, but it, it didn't make, I've watched it a million times on TV and you might have your ideas of what could, shoulda, woulda, coulda, but like I, I've done that too. And I'm sitting here now as part of it, as having been part of the team. And I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, we, we just got, we got beat that first day. I will say, I did talk to one of the players on our team the first day who told me, he goes, dude, uh, I was telling him how like data golf had a, you know, the best they can do with stats. It's obviously very um, flawed, but I did tell him, like, I was like, if you're curious, you know, there are stats. And he said that he looked at them and he thought that he had putt pretty awesome the first day and he had gained one stroke putting. And he's like, that's usually like a two or three type day. And that just kind of showed how well all the euros had putt that if he thought he had a great putting day and gained one whole stroke, like that was like, come on. We just, it just felt like they just played better than us that first day. And then you're digging the rest of the week. I don't know. I, it's not a real answer, but I, I, it doesn't, it truly doesn't make much sense to me. I feel like the Europeans are always fairly transparent about the things that they're doing in the team room and kind of almost like the motivational tactics. I mean, Luke Donald talked about, you know, basically getting, videos from everybody's family talking about this moment and they're they're notorious of course for publishing their hype videos and all of these things that they're playing in the team room and they they tend to really like go that direction i think just from a like i don't know i'm just fascinated by kind of the the coaching and captaincy and personality management of of the whole thing in in that you know i never know if the american team is going to take a like tom watson go get out there and kick their ass uh otherwise you're softies uh route or if they're gonna take the oh my god you're the best player to ever live route go out and do it what what's the what did you guys settle on what was kind of the the team room vibe or the the kind of uh motivational tactics that that are in there yeah i guess we don't do we don't go like the video route um i am always impressed by the guys both on this president's cup team last year and then especially this Ryder cup though of the players um kind of kind of like motivating us you know like J justin is so justin and jordan are so good at it um but i thought any, everybody who's been on a team was really good about it brooks was great about it i feel like everybody was you show especially when you showed up at the course everyone was really amped up and like music playing everyone's kind of dancing around the the gym doing their thing but like everyone was very amped you know trying to build that like mentality of we're gonna go out there and 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 kick some ass and i, I felt like that was kind of our motivational tactic we you know, I, I heard the Euros did some with like the videos and stuff from people. We didn't do that, but, you know, Zach was very uh, forward and basically what what we could do and, and reminding us how great we have been and, and things we've done in our careers and, and, and this and that. And I thought that the rest of the team did a great job of them like juicing it past that up to like a man to man thing of, hey. Like, I believe in you, like you're better than him. You're, you do this, like go, whatever it got. It, it almost was like, as you got to the course, you got even more pumped to go do it. That's why, again, it didn't make sense that we went out there that first day and, and lost four, four zero, unless I, I really do believe they just kicked, they just were better. Like, I mean, at some point there is, there are times when they just play great. And I thought that they all played great um, from everything I heard and what I saw in my match. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you, I, I, it's hard. It's like the, I have nothing to really compare it to. So yeah. I was motivated. I was very hyped to go play golf. Um, I was incredibly excited for the opportunity. I felt like everybody was and it's, but it's impossible to not feel a little deflated when it's four to zero at the end of the first right. session. I didn't even, I, mean, I was joking with 
uh, some of the other guys, I was like, I was like, what do you guys think the 17th hole looks like? Cause like <laughs> none of us made it there, you know, it was very odd. Uh, so I, I don't know for us and at least in this capacity, in this scenario, uh, what we could have done a whole lot differently, um, other than just play better. But yeah, I, I felt excited and ready to go play and, and I felt motivated, but they, they, they clearly have their, uh, thing they do over there and, and, at least in this one, ours is a bit different. But like I said, we're we're lucky we have these guys who have played on multiple teams, and and they are really good at being vocal leaders to ask questions to to get advice, and then also just to I mean, you only have to ask them; they'll come up and say it right to your face, basically like some kind of motivational something or other. I'm going to bounce a bunch of stuff off you, Max, just because uh, I, I sat in the press conference afterward and the, you know, heard the questions about foursomes, whatnot, heard Justin and Jordan say like, yeah, they just made more putts than us and chipped in more than us. And as a viewer, it felt bigger than that, right? It didn't feel like just, I, I feel like it can kind of get distilled down to, I don't want to call it luck. I mean, that's not necessarily luck when you make more putts and make more chip-ins, but it felt a teeny tiny bit like denial to me. Not even a teeny tiny bit. It felt a little bit like denial. Like the last, I'm not asking you to speak to other teams, but I think the opening sessions in foursomes, the U.S. is like 1-11 now or something like that over the last three opening sessions in foursomes. And from like the, the overwhelming feeling I think a lot of us had was um, even in defeat, Europe doesn't seem to, uh, th- their their energy kind of maintains, right? I mean, they got absolutely smoked at Whistling Straits, but I was kind of stunned at how great their moods were, how great like their their team support was. And it felt like, it felt like I was seeing uh, like puppy dog faces around and the energy was just zapped immediately. And to a viewer from the outside, it can feel like there's just something missing on the team front. I'm hearing what you're saying and what's going on in the team room. I'm hearing what you're saying on the support. But I think a lot of fans watching it don't feel that permeate the same way it does in Europe. And I'm not saying, hey, you got to do things exactly like Europe. There's cultural differences. There's a lot there. But I've been I feel like most of my career, I'm trying to spend figuring out how that translates to better play. Right. Like if you're on the first tee cheering on a teammate when you're not playing, that doesn't mean they're going to play better necessarily. But that seems to permeate. That's that 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 theme permeates so much through Europe. That it's a that's a big takeaway a lot of people have. What's the reality of that? What's your reaction to all the things I'm kind of throwing out to that on that note? Yeah, I can only speak to obviously this year's team, but I I call bullshit on all of it on all of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought that everyone's mood was really good. Um, we did have to have a couple guys go back early uh, if they weren't playing the afternoon because they weren't feeling good and we needed to get sleep. Like Brian, uh. I asked him what he did that afternoon and, you know, cause like if there was somebody, obviously I wanted to roll with me through the matches, it would have been him at that point since we played in the morning. Uh, I'm talking more for Friday afternoon, but I mean, he was, he was sick and, and, but he's like, he obviously grinded the whole thing on TV, um, but he needed to get rest. And honestly, it, it, there's one thing about this week that's brutal is you just don't get to sleep. Uh, they have so much stuff going on at nights and he needed to go catch up. So I, I get that a little bit if you, just from the outside looking in, but I, I can absolutely 100% promise you that the energy of the team was awesome. Everyone was very invested in the next one's matches. I know Brooks, Brooks is either one day or both days, didn't have a morning match, but I know uh, th- Friday morning, he didn't play the morning session and me and Bri come off nine and we're three down and a little bit bumming and, and there's, you know, somebody waiting for us as we make the turn towards 10 and it's Brooks, both hands out, you know, being like, come on boys, like this thing's not over yet. Like giving us uh, high fives and like getting us going. So uh, after the matches, like I said, we get the rides home, we ate at the course and everyone was like kind of telling stories about just like the shit the Euros were doing to us. But everybody was again, very adamant that that was eight points. Like it's eight points have gone by. We have a ton left. So I thought that the the mood for us was really good. And I don't mean good like, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean good like we are still fine. We are still United States of American team. We have some freaking dogs on this team. Everybody is as talented as 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 the next guy. And we just need to go play a bit better. I understand the denial that like we – they made the shots and we didn't. They're, we had to do a – we had to do a better uh, – we did a better job at night – of being like, hey, we have to stop thinking about how many shots they made and we didn't or where they hit it and they didn't. It was hard not to notice a little bit. And I'm not using, I'm not, I'm absolutely 100% not saying luck. I'm just saying just the amount of shots that went into the hole 
from nowheresville like that was a bit jarring and it felt like anytime you needed something to go one way it just felt like it went just a little bit the other way and you know even even in our match that first thursday morning or friday morning um we fortunately won the whole but like victor chips in on one we lose two and we get to three and they miss the green harm hit a great shot and we have 40 feet and harm and victor's got this tough chip and he kind of got it skinny and it's going to go 12 to 15 feet by and it smokes the pin and goes to an inch and i fortunately made the putt and then then they chip or then they hit the pin again on their chip on the next hole and you're kind of just like man this is that's three times in four holes <laughs> and then we make the turn at three down and um uh, Ludwig teed off on 10 and hit this necky little thing up the right into the hazard. And we get up there and it's not in the hazard. It's actually a pretty good line. Victor hits the green in two and you're just kind of like, such a good shot. what, when does this end? Because <laughs> when we hit it in the rough, you can't advance the ball. We got, I, I mean, me personally, sorry, got a little bit too caught up in the fact that it just felt like all those things were happening and we couldn't seem to make it go that way. But as far as the energy and the vibe, it was not anything even remotely down it, like i said it would have been really hard to do all that if it was like a if it was a single stroke play uh, event because i would have just been stewing and frustrated or whatever the, the the guys were really good about it but um i i and it's maybe maybe it's denial but i i really thought at least that friday morning they just kicked the shit out of us they played really freaking good um, i didn't think brian and i played terrible friday we we definitely let a couple slip but it, so much of it just felt like we were on the wrong side of the yard and um it just was really hard to to beat a team that's also playing really well at the same time. What was uh, what was it like inside the team when the Cantlay report came out? So th- that this that's the big. I know your boys with this guy Jamie, but that is the biggest bullshit I can remember, it, maybe ever. And and I did say what was fun that Saturday night was really fucking fun because I was telling Xander it's the first time I've ever like as someone who's far too online as myself it was really fun to be on the inside of something reading just a bunch of BS, like from everyone. So I was on 16. My, yeah, my match had ended. So we ran back to watch the other ones. And now we're on the last match was uh, obviously uh, PC and dub against Rory and Matt. And we're on 16, the coolest hole I have ever been on in my freaking life. Like the sickest thing ever. We're sitting behind the green, all of us. And we just need a flip. Like I said, all we needed was a flip, and it didn't look good. They're one down with three to play. And they're walking down the fairway, and absolutely everybody, 10, 20,000 people have their hat off, waving it. And we just think they're fucking with Pat because he's not wearing a hat. That's all we thought. And so they're doing it, and Pat's doing it back. Pat is being the most sarcastic, laughing at everybody. Every time we'd see him, he'd do like the hat, fake hat thing. Like, I mean, it was hilarious. We're all laughing. Like, this is so fun. This is what the Ryder Cup's about, you know? Like, Pat's embracing it. And then Pat goes, Pat, man. He made 10 footer, 9 footer, 35 footer. It was nuts. I, going back to what Brooks said, Pat wants the damn ball. Like, <laughs> there ain't no denying that. He is unbelievable. And he, he did the coolest thing I've seen in golf, and I can't remember. Those three putts and those three holes was tremendous. Also, it, it within that, Rory's chip on 17 was the sickest thing I've ever watched oh. in my whole life. Like, that was jarring. But then Pat steps up and buries that one right in his face and then makes another one. Then we have the Joe Lakov and Rory and Shane and Harry. It was the most fun. We were dying laughing. So then we find out that we go do, like, a press conference, and they send in, like, the six of us who had won the match that day. And we get in, and again, we know absolutely nothing. And the first, I would say – you guys might have been in there. The first 15 to 18 questions were about Pat's hat. And we were, that's the first time we all found out, same with Pat, that that was why everyone was doing it, was because he was somehow protesting the United States team because he didn't get paid to play, which is all bullshit. And it was it was the weirdest thing ever. Like, we couldn't get people to stop asking about the hat. I remember at one point they said, they finally asked a question that wasn't about the hat. Dub had already interjected and like, you guys are asking too much about this hat. Like it's not serious. It's not a real thing. And then I said something about like that. And then the very next question is about the hat. And you're just like, this is so, so weird. And one tweet, man, one tweet set all of Rome ablaze on that golf course where, and, and I'll say this, like we were frustrated and I could tell Pat was frustrated that like, like this isn't, it's not journalism. Like you can't just say, 
I have sources that say the team room's fractured. They said that they had a different dressing room than we did, which was hilarious. They said that they don't eat with us. They said that they don't do X, Y, and Z, him and him and Xander. And it was just like funny because it's like our team room didn't even have doors on anything. So we all were in the same room. Um, yeah, we, we had to take separate cars back to the course every day because that's how the thing worked out. Everyone was eating at different times because depending upon when you finished, how fast you got home is like when you could eat, you know, like you're going to bed at you're, sorry, you're getting back to the hotel at nine, doing physio, ice bath, workout, whatever. And then you're trying to go to bed as fast as you can because you have to be up at four. Like everyone was separated in those times. And when we were at the golf course, everyone was together. We love Pat and Xander. They are clearly like their own two peas in a pod, but th that's, it doesn't make me any less of a friend to Pat and Xander than I, I already was. There was no division. So it was, it was very weird to find out all that news and deal with all that, but it made it fun because I don't know the rest that, that that Saturday night was some of the funniest shit. The pictures, the videos, the everybody, man, it was it was it was funny and and I don't know. Everybody's saying that, like that's what we needed to galvanize. That's not what we needed. It just was fucking hilarious. <laughs> like it was, it just made the week more fun. It's not what we used as motivation. It just was like, what is going on here? It, I actually personally probably needed it because. I've been working with Julie, uh, my sports psychologist on this, and she's been pretty adamant that I am allowed to use Twitter and social and any social media, even though it's it's like really horrible cesspool of hate and whatever. It's okay to use it as long as I can look at it and be like, this is dumb. Laugh at it. This was the first time where it finally hit me. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I can. Like everything I read was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever read. Nope, that's the dumbest thing I've ever read. Because it was just all made up stuff and it was just like it got it got to the point where i was like okay finally like i get it like yeah none of these people know people just say stuff you can tweet whatever you want and a lot of people are like yeah no i i i i get that you know pat is only cares about the money doesn't care about the rider cup like you know he was gonna skip it it's just like none of it was accurate uh so it was like i said it just made saturday fun because we were all just dying like, I mean, we were getting rocked in the event so it gave us just a reason for everybody to go to bed happy and laughing and being like yeah we flipped that match and everybody's doing the hat thing and everyone was excited to do it the next day we had a we had a chat about like are we all gonna just go no hat because like that was a discussion and then Harmon goes i'll you know basically be ha be hatless with you in spirit but in in reality i'm incredibly bald and i'm gonna wear a hat i said the same thing i said i have a bald spot for me i will not play well if i don't have a hat on but i said i'll wave the hat on the first tee and do the whole thing all day so like that was kind of what we did but it was just i don't know dude it was just like hilarious and like i said finally i got through my thick skull that like the internet is just it's it's a weird weird place man it, it, uh on my assessment of things, it's like, okay, there was a lot of noise within that that was kind of easy to refute. Like, it, I, I I, truly don't think the hat thing was a protest in terms of players getting paid, but there's been several reports of Cantlay, among others, maybe uh, potentially Xander and Xander's dad and all that, talking about getting paid to play the Ryder Cup. W was that any discussion in the team room at all? Was that any distraction at any point? What's kind of your... Uh, window into that. I, I know that that to me that seems pretty darn distracting. Um, and it seems like there is a story there. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys felt that at all during during the week as a team. Yeah, no, I I will agree with you that that would be distracting if that ever fucking happened, but it didn't. So like zero times did we talk about that. Zero, literal zero. Pat was not protesting with by not wearing a hat, and we talked about getting paid zero whole times. The only time I heard the money thing come up is that. Luke Donald answered a question of, do you think the players should be paid? And a couple of us were talking about how his answer was very good. It was essentially of the X amount of weeks we play, it's nice to have one week where it's not about the money. And everyone was like, yeah, that's a really good point. I think that I, I think that you could argue just this money thing and we could like have a discussion and it, it, I don't think it needs to make somebody a villain or not, but it wasn't like some topic that we had throughout the week i again we talked about it that one time just because we thought luke's answer was quite good it was just a, a i thought well thought out and, and a, a good point if you're just going to uh, these days i mean in anything i guess you talk something about the money we talk about it with the commercial load on the tv like clearly trying to get more money like things like that but like it would be that much energy put into into it just a flipping oh that was a good answer you know that was nice of a good answer with Luke. The only the only 
uh, thing I saw of controversy, I guess, yesterday was the Xander not sign- signing or whatever, maybe getting, uh, I don't know, not let on the team or something. I was there there a was a report by- that, that uh, Steph and his dad had, Solly, correct me if I'm wrong, but said that, you know, as part of the release, you guys sign to be part of the Ryder Cup, which I think is put together by the PGA of America. There's all these things that you have to agree to. And one of them in there was... Uh, in the original draft, I think it, it sounded like there was going to be access for the Netflix oh, cameras in, Netflix, inside yeah. of Th- that was inside what I was of the team. Say, yeah. And so that was the only uh, thing that accounts, we had any. Yeah, Xander had pushed back on that and wasn't going to sign it. And according to this report in the Times, there was, uh, uh, you know, Xander's lawyers had been going back and forth and couldn't get an answer from the PJ of America. And Stefan's claim was that they didn't know if they were going to kick him off the team if he didn't sign it. Yada, yada, yada. All of which, Solly, I'm with you, adds up to like a very big distraction if that's something going on. Because the takeaway from that f- from Stefan was like, we didn't know as recently as a couple weeks ago if Xander was even on the team, which could be. Yeah, again, that would be very distracting if, if any of that was ever talked about. Like yeah. zero times did that bring, got brought up. The only thing that I would say the only thing that would have been a distraction is the Netflix thing, which we all said, no, thank you. When we had the option like two or three weeks ago, nobody wanted them in the team room. We, I, I like what they do for golf and whatnot, but I do not like it in the team room. I don't think anybody wanted them in the team room. It's like the one time you get to be just with, you know, the team, honestly. And it's just like nice to just sit down. We do a million things that week that it just felt like we haven't won this damn thing in 30 years uh, overseas. So let, should we add cameras inside or not? It felt like a very, like, do you guys want us to win or not? So like, this is simple. It was talked about that time and then never again. So all these things used as distraction, none of them actually came up in the week. I mean, I can't speak to like, if any of this is factual, but as far as distracting me, distracting Scotty, distracting Xander distracting Pat. I it never was brought up one time, and Xander says it about his dad. He his dad is not Xander. Xander's a grown adult as well. So like I again would like more I guess onus to be on asking Xander what he thinks and asking Pat what he thinks. You know, they they, they are they are the people I would ask these questions to, and I guess I got I get frustrated and honestly very frustrated in like the team fractured thing the most and i think that's why we've been leaning into it even though everyone's like well it doesn't matter if your team's close you guys still got killed the reason why we kept bringing it up is because that's what we keep reading tron and you don't know you have no idea because i we're it's like one of those weird things these days in like any kind of journalism or something that it says uh, you know we have a source as jamie said inside that says the team room is fractured and i, I get your point Sally. if there, you could take a lot of these things and maybe one's true maybe one's not but if one's not it makes the whole thing seem wrong and i get that but that line was so frustrating because everyone ran with it and it was so weird because it's like okay then someone would ask us in the media session are you guys fractured are you guys close and everyone's like this is the closest team ever stricker tweets at tron i think or at Jamie, this is bullshit. It's this is the this is the the strong like the most bonded team like we've ever had. And then Tron responds to him and says, "Oh, that's BS. Like, what a company line." It's like I I don't know who else you need to ask, but I wouldn't ask Jamie Weir if the team is is a bonded. You know, it just it seemed weird. You're asking all of us, and we are all telling you it wasn't a company company line. We all had a blast together. Um, like I said, I thought that the vibes were so good, even while we were getting killed, everyone was really motivating each other and believed in each other. We just didn't win. So th- that's why I think that tilted all of us the most. Um, if I had better hair and I could play sweating down my forehead, I would have not worn a hat on Sunday, but it just, it just got really like icky again. And that's where I guess for the first time I was on the inside of one of these types of stories where it just was weird because i just i can't tell you how wrong so much of what i was reading again on the internet but how wrong and dumb it was so that's what made saturday so fun is reading all this stuff and just laughing and being like you guys just don't know and you can't just keep i guess you can but it's just frustrating to hear people make things up like oh they keep saying they're close that must mean they're not very close it's like i we're saying it because you guys keep telling us that we're not and we're trying to give you an accurate accurate representation of what this team is about to if you're trying to figure out what 
is wrong with us playing foursomes or us playing overseas. We're trying to say, here's a variable you did not have to worry about this week. We're good here. We might need to look somewhere else to be better uh, if we, if we, if and when we do win, um, or sorry, if and when, uh, when we do play another one uh, on, on that side of the pond. What was uh, so you've played the Presidents Cup at home now, and you've played the Ryder Cup away, and you know I mentioned that shot on fifteen where you hold that chip and you turn around you know, screaming at some poor guy in the crowd, you know, just absolutely dressing him down, pointing at people. What, 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 what was do that? You don't do. Yeah. You just don't do that. What was your, uh, what was your overall assessment of, of playing in front of a foreign hostile, hostile crowd? It was honestly amazing. The fans are really great. And, and it, it was perfect. They give it to you and then they kind of take it. If you do something cool. Um, that guy in particular was a bit out of line, but it, it really was like as amazing as I can imagine. I, I, they're so coordinated and together, even the hat thing. Like, I don't know how they all got the same tweet and decided to do the same thing. It was really impressive. Tr- the chants are amazing. Well, I think. <laughs> yeah, probably. The, the, the chants are amazing. Everything was really it was just very coordinated and together. I think that they, their songs are just catchy. I was singing them the whole week. We couldn't get a lay lay. And my favorite song of all time is the Tommy Fleetwood song. I mean, like they're just so good at that stuff. And it really was incredible. It's fun. It was fun learning what a cheer for the U S sounded like and what one that was a ball went in the bunker for us sounded like you you got, you saw that. I thought that they were, they were really amazing fans. I was really impressed. They are, they are nasty and they're this maybe a bit more proper, but they say the same dumb shit that we say over here. But I felt like the the grand scheme of the coordination of all of it, if you ever, ever heard once a USA chant, it would immediately be followed by a Europe chant much, much louder. They were really good uh, about it. And I thought that they were, they were respectful when they needed to be. The only reason I yelled at Gaunt 15, because he was just an asshole, but um, we have plenty of those uh, over here as well. So I don't know. I thought that it was good. They, they, they were, I, I was it, was I, it weird? I mean, what, what was it like, like playing against, like in front of people who are rooting against you? Yeah. I, like, I mean, it's different. You, you hit balls and they scream, get in the water and things of that nature. But I thought that they were good while we were over shots a lot more. Um, but yeah, it was weird. Cause like you, you do things that are really cool and it's like the crowd noise is really subdued. Like I could hear myself yelling a lot more. And usually it, it, if you do that, it's so loud, you can't even hear yourself think. So that was different, but we all, we all had like the kind of the same tagline, all the players this week that we're just going to fall in love with the silence. And like, that's what we're going to adore of this week is just how quiet we can make this place. Uh, so it was different. It was weird, but I think you got used to it so quickly and it was really it was really fun. I, I, I hope to play on one in the States to be able to compare the two, but I think playing over there and if you ever could win over there, it just was tremendous. So what are, what are your takeaways, I guess, from the week amongst you either from yourself or from your teammates as a, the team as a whole, all with the captains, what, what are you taking away from this to say, all right, you know, not only for 2025, but also 2027, what's the path forward to getting this ship uh, turned around. I mean, the U.S. has had great success at home, and and I, I would expect that to continue at Beth Page. But at, at this point, I, I I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to pick the U.S. and Europe until yeah, yeah. So What what is what did you guys learn? What, what what's the learning part of this to say like here's what we're going to change going forward to make sure this doesn't happen again? I think that there's some things we're going to take little things and, and and keep tweaking. I did think Rory said it really properly that one of the hardest things to do in golf is winning one of these overseas i think it's very funny to think that we got drummed this week and uh every you know we're, we're assessing everything that the u.s doesn't care as much and this that or whatever whereas the last one in america we rinse them so I, I it's not one of those types of things i think it's maybe a little bit more of like the logistics and like little avenues if i had my druthers i wish we would have gone maybe a little bit earlier so it didn't feel like we were rushing around quite as much. But that's, again, that's up to a lot of other factors. I don't know if the course is open. I don't, I don't know what we are allowed to do and what and, and whatnot. Um, there's just going to be little things I think we pick away. I, I guess I left this thinking that there's, there's not one outstanding reason why we haven't done it over there. Um, there's probably just a lot of little things, but it's not for lack of effort. What I'm amazed by 
even more so than I was at the President's Cup. Is I, I'm amazed by how much these guys really do care and how how hard everybody worked each each day to be ready. I have never see Scotty get emotional, and he was like fist pumping and the putt he made on 17 on uh, Friday afternoon was sick and he just gave it to the crowd. Everyone's yelling. I just, you don't see that out of these guys week in, week out, myself included. So it was just really cool to see how much all of us cared and how much everybody, how hard everyone was trying. And I don't know, again, there's not one glaringly obvious thing, but I, I, I was pretty am- amazed that every one of the players and how, how much thought and effort went into making sure we were as ready as we could be to win this thing. And and when each session ended kind of like a quick think and talk and, okay, we're going to get back out there and do it again. There was really no give up in this team. And like I said, for 20, 30 minutes, I thought we, I thought we did the damn thing. So I don't know. It, it's, it's again, I don't know what's possible and what could be changed, but I don't think it's anything major. I just think it's little, little things here and there that hopefully can, can flip this thing around a little bit. Can I, can I, uh, just a follow to that? Here's how I feel about this. Even going all the way back as a narrative around Tiger, narrative around Phil and all that, you know, in their Ryder Cups that they didn't care about it. And I never bought into that. I, I, if you, Jim Furyk has dedicated how much of his life into just yeah. turning this Ryder Cup thing around. I've never once believed that people don't care. My kind of general, again, from my 10,000 foot view, my takeaway is that the way Europe cares about it inspires um, it inspires them to play better golf. And the way that the U.S. tends to care about it, I, there's zero doubt in my mind that you guys care a ton about winning this. But the way you guys do it can tend to lead to more pressure put on yourself more than inspiration. That is my my view. That, that if I look at the strokes gain numbers for the week and I see some American players in the negative for the week, that doesn't. I, I just can't. I can't explain that other than like something got to you this week. Something was not right in some way, some way in the process. That's what I was curious to. You know, I feel like you guys are a little bit on the defense in terms of like, yeah, we do really care. With me sitting here, I don't doubt that one single bit. But have you learned anything to say like, here's the best way to channel that energy going forward and to play our best golf? Um, I get, no, it's, my, my experience is just so different because I, I was dealing with just like immense nerves kind of going into like all the whole lead up, the build up to each day, getting closer to Friday. Like that's what, what was on my mind. I just want to make sure I was as ready, like emotionally as possible. The guys who have been on teams before probably had more pressure because they kind of knew what it or sorry, they were more focused on what it was for. Um, again, I, I do think that it, it helps that the Euros, just like the most basic thing ever, that most of them were already over here and like jet lag was in a thing. Like the first three, sorry, the first two nights, like I didn't sleep very much and you're not going to sleep much Thursday before you go play. So it's just, you're definitely like a little bit worn down. Um, when they come to America to play in the Ryder Cup, which again, just a friendly reminder, we won by like 10 points last time we did this. So uh, they, they most of, like a lot of them live here. Um, you know, I know Rory and Shane were at the rugby, the Ireland rugby match uh, for their World Cup. So they were already over here. I do think that's like a benefit because jet lag is a real thing. You waste two kind of nights of sleep, not sleeping. So little things like that, I, I think, would go a long way. I don't think it's an energy of the team. I really thought that this team was like the difference between the president's cup and the Ryder cup. What I noticed was how much more hyper-focused all the players were on doing great. You could tell the president's cup. I think because we've won it so many times, there was this air of like, yeah, we're going to go win it again. And it wasn't maybe as, as heightened. So I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. That that's different, but I was impressed by how serious everyone was taking this, like very, very serious. And so I don't think it's like an energy in that. There's obviously when you have a stigma that you can't do something, which is what we've had. I think that stick that must just stick out in people's minds. And I really do believe in manifestation, and we stink at foursomes usually, especially overseas, and we don't win overseas. Like those are the three things that I would that say stick out about the United States just record since I've been alive. And we go out there, 
Friday morning, and we are all down in the first 10 minutes of each person's match. Like, it's almost like you're like oozing it in a way. So if I was going to change energy, I wish I would have maybe been more on the offense mentally, just like immediately. But like, that's a lot to ask from myself because I was just trying not to shit my pants for the first like hour of the day. So I don't know. Um, again, I think the more experienced guys would have a better idea, but I, I don't, I really just don't think it was for lack of energy or lack of something. Like I, I know that, you know, the term you, you've used, like we just didn't get off the bus, but like it felt like everyone was like, did it felt like the everyone was bounced around like excited to get going and i'm just not i'm not i'm really not sure i i i can buy into that the, the europeans do seem to have something of like the that it, it feels bigger for them and maybe for us it's more like we just really want to win it i don't know if that makes sense but like maybe but i again i've been on one of these and i thought that everyone was freaking dialed like mm. into doing the best that they could for the guy next to him. It just did not, did not work this year. I think that, yeah, on that note, like I, I am working on writing something now that I guess is trying to put these thoughts into, into, you know, words, but hearing Justin Rose and Rory and Rom and those guys talk about it in the press conference. I think it was like one of my favorite parts of the week when Rose kind of spelled out, you know, like, Hey, the reason that I think KVB asked him, what does it mean to be a European Ryder Cupper? And he said, well, it means like basically like writing the next chapter of this story. And it to me, it feels like they are all, they've all been like reading the same book for 40 years. Right. And they show up and they're like, holy shit, I can't believe I get to write a chapter of this book because I know all the past pages. I know all the players. I know all the moments. I know all of these things. And I can't believe I get to be one of those people. And in my head, and I'm not assigning this, you know, or like putting this on you, but in my head, I'm like, man, that's just not how the U.S. team seems to feel right like i don't hear anybody ever talking about their favorite ray floyd memories or trevino memories or oh my god did you see what jim furick did at the belfry did you see and and it's just very very different to me to where it feels to me yeah, like but DJ, we haven't we haven't we don't we haven't won over that's here what i mean no years. that's so that's like, what i'm what saying I there's <laughs> totally no that's what i'm saying and to me it, it felt like in the crux of kind of what i was trying to write and i guess i'll just uh get your opinion on it now so i can just delete it if it's stupid is uh to me it almost feels like it needs to jump start a brand new culture like it needs to the identity needs to be like the way that those guys talk about those teams of 30 years ago teams 30 years from now are going to fucking talk about us we're the ones yeah, that are going to yeah. do it and we're going to start right now planning for the next four years of how we're going to do it and like we're not going to carry this kind of uh you know, fog with us over there of just like trying to not lose rather. It's almost like, what's the, what's the goal? Let's start working on it right now for the next four years. No, I like that. I, I do think that something I got wrong, but I think that goes to your point that we'll get right for the next one is I, what I got wrong is that none of these guys minus, I think like three or four of them have really been a part of like right. the troubles overseas. So I thought, Oh, we're going to have this clarity. However, the problem with that was is because we a lot of us have never played in it over there. Scotty, our best player, has not played in one over there. So I will say that I, I am optimistic that this young crop of guys, Colin, Sam, Scotty, uh, you know, all, all those boys are like, now they have, um, they have a template for what they think could be better as we go over there. Like it, I, I do think that this will jumpstart that. I, I guess I just had it wrong that, oh, just because we don't know what it feels like to lose, we don't feel that burden, which I don't think that we really felt the burden. We we have felt the opportunity to be the team that burst of this bubble. Um, but yeah, I just think that maybe now that that has, that we have all felt this. Like I, I, I am freaking 32. I've been talking to Lacey about this. I'm 32. I'm, I will have to be, I'll be 36 if I, by the next time this thing comes back over here, I'm going to do my absolute damnedest to make sure my body can keep up whatever I've been trying to do uh, golf wise so that I have an opportunity to play on that team. Because I think for guys, you know, like Scotty and Colin and them, like they, they'll be on that team uh, regardless. They're, they're so good and they're so young. I think hopefully having enough of these guys who were on this one, but separate from the ones we've been so kind of 
that are in our minds of, of the, the failures, I think that that will carry them forward. I like your idea of making the culture be like, we're going to be the guys who change how this works. Um, but I do think that it's a, it's a learning curve. We all went over here, not all, but most of us went over here without a clue of what it was going to be like. And we got a taste. And I thought that we built upon that as the week went on. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that just that experience alone, as, as much as Rory was, you know, excited and banging on the table that they're going to win at Beth Page, I think we all have that feeling too, but, but we want to win both of them. And, and I think everyone's pretty hyper-focused on doing this in four years, oddly enough. And, and they'll get, you know, everyone will be ready for Beth Page, but I just do feel like it's starting to get to the thing that everybody's starting to see how cool it would be to win away. And I think that's what like the Scotties and the Sams and the Collins of the world will, or of the country will start to like, that'll be their uh, rallying cry in a way. Yeah. Man, I'm, I'm weirdly more fired up for it than, uh, than when we left. Yeah. I don't know. I don't it's know. Most spe- I, I got to tell everybody it's the most special week. I, I, I really, it, it is. So Fooch came up to me. I don't know if I told you guys this after the president's cut, but Fooch came up to me when he was cutting for Billy. Uh, and we were playing like Friday or Saturday or whatever it was. Pooch came up to me, we're on the 10th hole, and he goes, how is it? Like, how's your experience? He's been on a million of these teams. I'm like, dude, Pooch, this is the coolest damn thing I've ever done in my life. And he goes, all right. He goes, well, you know, the, the next time you're hot in Arizona or you're tired or you're sore or whatever, he goes, I want you to remember this. Go practice because the Ryder Cup's 10 times better. It's bigger. It's crazier. It's more intense. The history is different. Like, it's just, it's just, it's just on steroids. So I play Rosie, you know, on the first day and on, on the second match. And he comes up to me on like the eighth hole or something like that. And he goes, he goes, all right, Max, how'd I do? How, how, how was my uh, little chat with you? And I said, Fuchs, you undersold it. I said, the first tee alone was nothing I have ever thought was real or possible. And the Ryder Cup, if you could ever go to one, I, I, you should go. It is insane, man. The intensity of it alone is, it, it's crazy. The The first tee is, like I said, it, it, the, the just the amount of people was was wild, but how everyone's so into it and so coordinated and all the chants. I mean, Lacey was showing me videos, all these chants I never even got to like see or hear. I mean, it's just the most special thing you could ever imagine doing. And it was truly like, the most grateful I've ever been just to have like these memories win or lose. I told Brian, we got our asses handed to us Friday morning. And I still was like, dude, that was fucking so fun. <laughs> it was just so much fun. The few moments we did have were just exponentially better than any moment I've had by myself playing a round of golf. So it was, it, it lived up to every ounce of the hype that I've heard about it. I was walking, I think, watching your match on Friday afternoon, maybe, and looked over and saw Lacey talking to Novak Djokovic. I was like, yeah. oh, that's that doesn't happen at a lot of events. Like, that's, huh, he's here. Like, that's this must be she, kind of a big deal. Was, <laughs> Novak's buddy, I guess, was like, Lacey doesn't know anything about tennis. And she knew that he was obviously like some important tennis player, but she didn't get it. And her, th- this guy's. Uh, sorry, Novak's friend was like dumbfounded. Like, you have not heard of Novak? Because <laughs> <laughs> not really, man. She's like, I watched Real Housewives. Like, has he ever been on? <laughs> it was so great. I was like dumbfounded. Everybody is when, uh, you know, she, she, I mean, she's asked Christian Yelich if he's ever hit a home run before. It's, they're always my favorite conversations. They're just like, you want to get humbled really fast? Talk to one of our wives. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good reminder here, guys. First pitch is in about an hour. Yeah. Yep, my man's got a head. Uh, um, I'm a Brewers I, fan until the Dodgers have to play him. That's what they. I, I think the uh, the overwhelming like reaction from the rest of the guys that hadn't been to a Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits walking off was just kind of like, eh. I mean, Sal, you kind of talked this event up a lot, and that was just kind of okay. And I feel like DJ, I feel like you turned at this. Oh one. yeah, okay. big time, big okay. time. No, it was the venue was great. The crowds were awesome. Uh, even just getting Max, you referenced it, but even just getting that like 20, 30 minutes of like, oh shit, it might happen was, was enough. Was enough. I can't imagine being at one where that it's like close from the beginning. Yeah, it would. That that is, I guess, one thing that makes you crave like the because as close as it felt on Sunday, 
it, it probably like um, uh, statistically wasn't like you forget how fast a match totally. can go from one down to one up the other way or to one up. Like, but it's crazy how the singles, it will always deliver some kind of hype because I was on the 12th hole. I had never really pieced together that my match could be the one that like loses it. You know, like I, I was excited to go out early and we had like everybody just like threw out the euros just throw out their horses like immediately. So it was one of those like, okay, if we can get off to a good start, like we will we'll have a chance. And then I started to realize, oh shit, like my match could be like the 14th and a half point match. And so I look over at 12 and I start to realize that. So you start doing the math. I'm like, okay, well that one just finished. Um, that one looks like uh, we're going to lose it, but we're going to win this one. And you start doing the math and you're like, okay, if it comes down to mine and I can stay one up, they'll have 14 points. And then there's just a block of red. And it was the most arousing thing <laughs> I've watched. Cause I'm like, holy fuck. I, Joe and I were talking about it. He, without talking about our match, which we never really brought up of like, we need to win. <laughs> we were just like, we could fucking do this. Cause it's going to, it could come down to dub and Ricky. And I was like, you just had to flip two, like one or two of those matches. And it wasn't unreasonable, but you start to right after my match ended, you know, I find out like, you know, I think Jordan lost a hole or, or you no, know, Ricky lost or somebody lost a hole. And I was just like, what? Like how are, and you're like, okay, well they're one of, of course, like that's the easiest, but you just saw a sea. Finally, we saw a sea of red. I'm like, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to pull off the coolest damn thing that we could ever dream of. Uh, and so th- that was where it did get, at least it got really fun as far as the contest goes, but yeah, it would be pretty intense if you were in that, like the whole time where every match felt like it came down to the half point, because that's what was crazy about the end of that Sunday was, we needed every one of those to stay full red, but that's where it, it as much as we got killed when you uh, score wise, when you look at it, Victor made a crazy 20 footer on 18 that if it was one inch shorter does not go in and Rom, if it was one inch harder does not go in that thing's still rolling towards our team room. You, you have moments like that, that those two flip to a full point sorry, a half point where we, we got a full point. Uh, Rosie makes birdie on mine when mine lipped out. That's another full point. Like it, it's a lot closer than you think when you add them up at the end, but they just did, they just played so well that like we had to keep, we basically felt like we had to keep winning the 18th hole to keep momentum where they were just kind of always felt like they were in front. And that that's what it really came down to. They played so well that we needed to, we needed to be so it felt like perfect at the end of each match. And, and they just seemed to always, they owned the first hole and they owned the 18th hole. It just felt like that the, the whole week. And, and that was, that was, that was tough, but it, it, it is nine, crazy seven. when you look at all of them, there's a lot of putts that you, at the end of the round where you're like, damn. Yeah. If the, if, if, if the Friday four ball doesn't flip like it does, it's nine, seven uh, at the end. And that was yeah. like, that would have been, yeah. It looked like the the percentage chance at one point Sunday got to with a eight point three percent that you could come all the way back and tie it and retain, which was looking. I mean, before that, it was down to one percent. Like it was really, really rare. Yeah, uh, really few up. Like it was a, a pretty decent. I, I know that probably doesn't sound like a whole lot to people, but that's like no for Medina, <laughs> that happened at Medina. Like it was below one yeah. percent at Medina, and it somehow happened. So it's forever hope, but. That singles makes it fun because you can you can see how it works. I mean, you you have obviously they have twelve of the best players on the planet, and we do too. So at any point, any of those that's what we kept saying. Like all of us could win a match against anybody. So you just got to go do it, and everybody was doing it for a little while, and it was it felt very real. But um, yeah, at least we had we had that. that that's what I kind of took with myself, or uh, took we took with us. I think is I was like at least we made them sweat for a little bit because it makes their celebration better for them. And I feel like it, it, the hope we had, I mean, it was a fun 30, it was a fun 30 minutes. I, it, I promised on Friday night, I would never pick the U S to win in Europe again. I made it all the way to Monday and I'm <laughs> I'll like, pack no, I, see in, baby. I see the path. I totally start, see the path. start printing the t-shirts. <laughs> so all right, I, we'll, I would, I, I hope to be a part of it. Cause I think it would be the coolest damn thing. Uh, you could do as a golfer in your lifetime. Now, now that I've been to one, I, I think winning over, over there, Winning it all, it's got to be amazing. But there, there was something about being over there and I, finding true hatred for their fans while respecting the hell out of them. <laughs> I, I finally get that now. There's a true division in my heart. Every one of you European fans over there, 
I respect you so much. And I absolutely fucking hate you and want to see you guys feel how sad I felt that Sunday night. <laughs> Welcome to my life, Max. I'm glad we get to say things <laughs> to that. So, um, all right, dude. Well, I think this is either an hour and a half episode or an eight hour one. And I think we're going to choose the uh, the first one because I, I, we can keep you here forever. But uh, we really appreciate the it's the only way we could. We had to, we had to have you back immediately for the reaction, man. I appreciate you <laughs> on some jet lag. So, um, thanks so much. We'll uh, maybe do another one uh, here in a couple of months if you've had some more time to reflect on because there seems, it seems like there's a whole lot more there. But we appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys very much for having me. Uh, tell tell your families hi. And uh, DJ, root on the Brewers. Root on my boy Yelly for me. Uh, but just let them know the, Dod- the Dodgers are coming for them. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I will let them know. I'll pass along your message. I'll pass, I'll <laughs> pass the note down down the uh, grand, down the stands for the dugout. Here, pass it All on. Right, you, boys. Appreciate it. Cheers.